very good way to generate a sort of uh, analog sound. And that is, as you might recall, um, doing variations in pitch over time and within the wave itself. Those and those ways in combination with, you know, layered oscillators will generate a really genuinely or at least acceptably analog sound. But if we want to go a little bit deeper, here is a way to go all out because vintage oscillators are analog. They vary and they don't just vary in frequency. They vary in amplitude to some degree and uh, wave shape. Now, these variations may be very tiny. Obviously, if you had an oscillator that was varying in amplitude extensively, you know, it'd be getting louder and softer. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about like drift in amplitude so it gets slowly louder and slowly quieter or, uh, you know, sweeping changes in waveform. We're just talking about the fluctuations in the waveform itself in both the size of the waveform and the shape of the waveform. Uh, this synthesizer, and certainly many synthesizers, but uh, maybe not so many synthesizers, uh, but I suppose a lot of digital synthesizers today are capable of doing this, but we have the ability to mess up our waveform and certainly mess up our amplitude, but you could do that with many, many synthesizers, so I'm not going to really demonstrate that. But I do want to talk about some ways that you can alter your waveform so that it's not so pure. And this is important because, okay, this synthesizer sounds great, just the architecture of it, it was so well designed. But, you know, if we hold a note, it is, certainly we have the timbre, but in general, that is a waveform that is not changing. That is a digital waveform. It has that purity. It has that stability. A lot of people would like that. But if we're looking for analog sound, that's not going to cut it because that's not what vintage analog synthesizers do. So on this synthesizer, they it's like they foresaw this. Now, really, they I think they set this up because we often think about pulse width modulation, uh, something that people often think is like distinctly analog. Uh, but pulse width modulation is really changing the shape of the waveform over time, which is a good idea. It's just that we do it with pulse width modulation in a long sweeping fashion that gives us just a change in timbre. That's not what we're talking about. But when uh, the fine people at DSI created the Pro 2, they gave us some opportunities to... Uh, mess with our wave shape and create pulse width modulation uh, with any waveform, really. Uh, they have this shape modulation. So if we go into the oscillator, like we choose the sawtooth that we've chosen, we have the ability, you see shape mod there. And you can see I'm actually changing the shape of the wave. But when we do that, even though we're using a sawtooth here and pulse width modulation is associated with square wave, uh, we're, we're hearing sort of a pulse width modulation sound. But what if we, oh, did I leave that on? Not exactly the shape of one. Okay, uh, so what we would want to do is we would want to go up into the magic section, the modulation section. Let's choose LFO1, and then let's choose Oscillator 1's shape, shape mod. Okay. Okay, so we have a wave here triangle wave here's a way to get like this is pulse width modulation which sounds really cool but that is not what we're looking for uh, of 
course, it distracts you from how rigidly in tune that oscillator is. But uh, we can, uh, or not only as rigidly in tune as that oscillator is, but how rigid its wave shape is. Um, we can break that up using this. But the, the best thing to do would be to go into the LFO and choose random. <laughs> Now, you may say to yourself, uh, hey, dude, <laughs> that is not at all an analog sound, and you'd be right. But I wanted you to get a sense that the random is like sample and hold. It is different voltages at different points, and it creates a fluctuation. In a way, it's kind of like noise, and if we sped it all the way up, it would be a lot like noise. But instead of speeding it all the way up, what we want to do is is we want to smooth it out so it's truly like wave fluctuations instead of step fluctuations. So if we go into LFO control, we can control the slew rate. So now all of those fluctuations that we get from the random steps, now they are slewed. So the changes in those waveforms are gradual. And in doing so, we just have a voltage that varies, which is basically kind of like, in this case, it's like a wave shape that can't, is trying to hold this wave shape and is, is, is having trouble either because there's noise in the line or fluctuations in the voltage that the unit is getting, or I don't know, maybe old capacitors, would that cause that? I'm not sure, but whatever causes variation in old oscillators, whether it's by design or by age or by, uh, you know, who, what other factors, this is a good way to create a fluctuating voltage. So then what we would do, we would go back to our assigned source area and we would diminish the amount. So now it is, there's a fluctuation going in that wave shape. I wonder if it shows it. Let's see. No, I guess it only shows it when you're turning the knob. Uh, and it may say shape mod zero here, but we're definitely getting some shape mod and you can kind of hear it. It doesn't have to be overt because if it were really overt, whenever you heard an, an old fashioned oscillator, an analog oscillator, you'd be like, it, you'd be like, if you heard it doing what it's doing right now, you'd be like, I can hear that there's something wrong with this oscillator. As low as two is, like you can hear that there's a slight fluctuation, but you wouldn't necessarily notice it. You can definitely hear sometimes that there's a slight difference in timbre. Uh, but what happens like when we add another oscillator? You can actually kind of hear, you can compare the oscillator one, which is varying to oscillator two, which isn't. And you can kind of hear it just sounds unstable. And that's exactly what we're looking for. So then, now that on its own is probably not enough <laughs> for you to be like, oh my gosh, this sounds so analog. But when you combine it with the other factors, which we're going to do in the next video, you can uh, definitely hear it's just one little thing. And the reason I think people have had trouble emulating analog is because they think it's one thing that makes analog sound analog when really it's almost an infinite amount of things. But we can fake some of these things, the more overt things, and have 
this great outcome uh, that we're actually seeking. And so that's kind of what, why I'm showing you these individual steps and I'll show you another step in the, in the next video before we put them all together and here like, here's what, <laughs> here's how this can sound analog. Okay, so yes, we've just seen how to very effectively and immediately give ourselves a, uh, a very, an, an oscillator with varying wave shape like you might get from a very old oscillator. Also, don't forget that you could theoretically change the frequency. Depending on what you're looking for and how it sounds to you. Yeah, I think I might like it a, a bit faster like that. Yeah, it's messy. I love it. We should have sped that up to begin with. Anyway, uh, that is how we can uh, modify the wave shape slightly in order to mess up the digital stability and purity of this digital oscillator.